Hi there, my name is Dr Viv Rolf from De Montfort University in Leicester and this screencast is an introduction to STAIN Chemistry and Technology and it's part one of two. It's an open education resource so everything you see is openly available and licensed under Creative Commons unless otherwise stated. So let's get our head around some terminology relating to histology and stain chemistry then. So histology is the microscopic structure of normal tissue. Histopathology, as the name suggests, patho, this is the microscopic study of disease tissue. So have a little think, what do you think cytology is and what do you think cytopathology is? So go away and have a little think about basic terminology that you might encounter. And what, what equipment might you use in the histo lab? Well, the mainstay of the histo lab is the light microscope. Um, the microscope's been around for a couple of centuries now, and as it evolves and develops, the lenses get more advanced. And um, we can see quite good resolution now with um, air immersion lenses and oil immersion lenses. So before you go into any laboratory setting, you can use our open education resources, um, which you've got the link to our YouTube videos there that show you how to set up the microscope, what the different parts are, and um, how you actually can get started with it. Okay, so go away and um, have a look at those if you're not familiar with the light microscope. So, well, why do we bother staining tissues at all? Can't we just look at them as they are? Well, so biopsies and specimens, these go off to the histo lab and they get wax embedded and preserved and sectioned. So what often comes to us to stain is a glass slide with a piece of tissue on. Now, if we just looked at that down the microscope, on the left is a representation and you might be able to see some, some kind of structure, but really not in a great amount of detail. So we need to stain tissues in order to visualize the cell structures, and um, detect some of the chemical nature of the tissue. So when we stain that one on the left with um, Marcia's scarlet blue, um, as shown on the right there, you can see we're already starting to visualize some of the cell components, and that's adrenal gland, and the nuclei have stained pink, and the collagen, which is the outer capsule of the adrenal gland, that stains blue. So that's a lovely stain that we'll talk about in later resources. And stain technology, well, it's lovely, really, and a lot of it is exactly the same as what happens in the textile industry. So a lot of dyes used to, to um, colour our clothes are exactly what we'll use in the laboratory. And the principles are quite, quite straightforward. So a dye is a coloured compound that binds to a substrate. And it's got mostly two parts. It might have a chromogen, which is the coloured bits that we see, and an oxochrome, which is a component that can bind to a substrate. Okay, so as a little animation suggests, as we throw our dye onto our tissue or clothes, it will bind to the substrate and um, then we can visualise whatever that substrate is. And dyes can be classified in a number of ways and you might think, oh, it's obvious to classify them by colour and, and sometimes you can do that. In terms of histology and um, referring back to Kieran's 2007 histological histochemical methods textbook there, dyes are arranged into 16 groups and I've listed some of them here that are more commonly used, particularly in more basic histology practicals. So we're using basic dyes, acid dyes and mordant dyes. So what do these mean? Well, the basic dyes, these are coloured cation components. So these are positively charged dyes and they can bind to neg negatively charged ionic substrate. So a positive dye can bind to a negative substrate like DNA, for example. An acid dye is the other way around. So a coloured anion can bind to a positively charged substrate like an amino acid or cytoplasm. And also commonly used are mordant dyes. And these are dyes which have metal salts within them. And we'll talk about these because these are of particular importance in the lab. So just to finish off this resource, um, this is the hematoxylin and eosin stain, which is a, a widely used stain around the world. And it's a simple stain with two colours. And in our next screen, screencast, we'll go and look at the H&E stain in a bit more detail. Right, this is our second screencast. 
looking at stain chemistry and technologies. I'm Viv Rolf from De Montford University. Now, most histological stains apply one, two or three colours. So three colours are known as trichrome stains and these give lovely visual representations of cells and tissues. In most protocols, the lowest molecular weight dyes are applied first and these are low molecular weight so they can penetrate the nuclear membrane and stain the nuclei more often. Then um, you wash off the rested residue and other counter stains are applied. Now there's some terminology here. So we might stain um, progressively and this means we apply a dye and the colour then gradually builds up over time. Or we might do regressive staining, mean, mean, meaning that when we put the dye on it over colours everything and then what we need to do is remove the excess and we do this by differentiating which is often in an acid alcohol and that gives us our desired colour. So we'll talk about the hematoxylin and eosin stain abbreviated to H&E and it's the most commonly used stain around the world it's got to be it's widely used in hospital diagnostic laboratories and also in research and it's a simple stain with two colours and it stains tissues purple and pink and these images here are all H&E there's one or two that perhaps aren't so good but you can see the variety of pink and purple within those tissues so we'll understand what that means and hematoxylin it's purple it comes from the bark of the logwood tree in Latin America so you can see some textile here some cotton stain lovely purple with the hematoxylin um, it's a bit of a misnomer so um, it's we need to understand um, how, how the name is actually derived. The hematoxylin is actually the chemical that's extracted from the logwood tree. Then it's oxidised to form hematin. And when it complexes with metal, because it's a mordant dye, it's one of those dyes that is bound to metal, um, it's more rightly called hemalum. So the, the compound we use in the lab from the dropper bottles should be really hemalum, but we commonly call it hematoxin, but just be aware that is slightly different. So, second point here, it is a mordant dye and it can bind, bind to a variety of metals. Most widely used is aluminium um, in Mayer's hematoxin or iron in Weigert's hematoxin, and they all give just slightly different colours. Mayer's more of a brighter purpley blue, and we can, we can get a desired blue by plunging it into an alkaline solution like Scott's tap water but you might not need to do that in parts of the country where the tap water is more acidic. Um, the iron, the Weigertz, is a deeper bluey black um, and we differentiate that in, in different, different acids to um, give the desired colour. So essentially hematoxylin it binds to DNA, it's a um, cationic dye so it's binding to anions within DNA molecules. Eosin is slightly different, so it doesn't come from a plant. It's widely used in the cosmetic industry. It's a lovely pink red colour. It's actually derived from the compound fluorescein, which in itself, in itself is a synthesised compound. It's a synthetic organic compound, and it was produced by a chemist, um, a German chemist, I think, over a century ago. So he, I, he discovered fluorescein, which is a, a fluorochrome, and it is used in microscopy. But from fluorescein, we can get the pinky red dye, eosin. So it's, it's different to the mordant hematoxylin. This one is an anionic dye. Okay, so it's an anionic counter stain and it's, it's a more commonly used in the form of eosin Y. And being anionic, it will bind to positively charged, positively charged compounds like amino acids and cytoplasm components. Okay, so it gives tissues a lovely pink wash. It stains stuff pinky red. So the H&E stain, if you break it down, you're applying the hematoxylin, the small molecular weight, you're rinsing, you're differentiating, so removing the excess dye from the cytoplasm, then you're bluing it in Scott's tap water, and then because you've differentiated it, you can apply the eosin, then you rinse, and then you go through the processing steps, all right? So you can understand why you're doing certain steps in your protocol. And your results will vary depending on the makeup of the tissue, which we'll look at in future resources. And just to leave you with some final links.